watching the Forefront Church video podcast. And wherever you're at viewing online, we just want to say thank you and welcome. And one of the ways that we can help connect with you is we want to hear from you and where you're at and how we can help. And so head over to ForefrontChurch.info after the message and click the Connect tab. It's a great way for us to help you along your spiritual journey as you connect with God and learn about Jesus. And so sit back, relax. We hope that you're challenged and encouraged from today's message. Have you ever been misunderstood or maybe misrepresented? Have you ever had someone think they know you only to meet you and say, oh, you're nothing like I thought you were? We've all at different times been labeled. We've all had things assumed about us that, well, aren't true. And the truth is, we do this with God too. Millions of people throughout time have gone through life thinking they know about God, the Bible, and the divine. But do we know who he truly is? And do we know what he's really like? I'm glad that you're here and I'm glad you're with us as we wrap up today our series, Four Things I Wish You Knew About God. And this entire series stemmed from as I began exploring faith. Now, my parents took me to church, but I would say that honestly, I didn't buy into all of it. I wasn't buying what they were selling. But years went on and God started spurring me on to this search for the divine and what it meant to follow Jesus God, faith, the church at large, and there are things that I learned that honestly had to be undone in my thinking about how God moved, breathed in people's lives and how he interacted with them that had to change. And we started off in week one realizing that, well, each and every one of us are black sheep. At least we have moments that we think that way that we feel like we don't fit in, especially with God or his church. And we started likening it to the fact that for many of us, we feel like broken vessels. We feel like we've been beaten up and bruised and wronged and we have hurt and unforgiveness and all of this stuff happening. We feel like God could never interact with our lives, much less love us and want to be in our corner. And then God, as we explore faith, begins pouring into our life. We go, God, there's no way that my life could ever produce anything beautiful, loving, caring, gracious. And God goes, all right, well, why don't you try me? In our lives, as we've interacted, we go, it's just going to be awful. And all, then all of a sudden, we start pouring out love and grace and beauty to others. And we go, huh? And they go, huh? And we look at our lives and they look at our lives and they go, how did that happen out of this? And we're able to go, man, that's miraculous. That's God. That has nothing to do with me. And where we landed in week one is we go, wow, actually God isn't up there like a celestial curmudgeon trying to throw. He's like, all right, you did good, did good, did good. Oh, you did bad. Lightning bolt. And it's like broken carburetor, water heater fails, life falls out of place. That we realize that God doesn't interact with mankind that way and that God is for you. That God is in your corner and mine and that God wants what's best for you and I. And so landing in that, starting the series out, I didn't realize that until much later in life, that that is good news for you and I. But we knew we couldn't stop there. And so we got in to week two as we started looking at the box of life. And we would shake it and try to open it up because we wanted to figure out what was best for us. And we would try to open it up with the things that made us happy because, well, the reality is most people think, and I know that I did, that God is concerned with my happiness. That God wants me one day to find a spouse. And so we try to open that key of life. And well, God wants me to eventually have kids and hopefully I won't send them to meet Jesus. And so we'll open that up and see if that unlocks it. And we go, oh no, no, maybe it's about my job. And we try to fit all these things into the keyhole to open up the box. Well, we found out in week two from this guy named Paul, who was an early church planner, he started churches and following God, is that he told us the key. He told us what it is to open it up. And while it doesn't look like we anticipated, 
And we look at it and we go, all right, God, that is smaller than I imagined. And I thought life in you was going to be grandiose and all of these things. We open up and go, it's prettier than that ugly thing that you gave me at first. But all right, there must be something beautiful inside because clearly you would not give bad gifts. And in week two, we opened up this box called joy and go, wait, God, I think you made a mistake. I think that there's supposed to be, you, you forgot what was in the box. And God goes, actually, what if I told you that all the things that bring you happiness, those are great. And I'm glad that you have them. But what if joy alone in me would be enough? And what we realized in week two is that God alone is your source of joy. He's my source of joy. That even when your marriage and relationship's doing well, God is still good. And then when it is falling apart or maybe collapses entirely, that God is still good. That when your kids are doing great or they're off the rails or the job is soaring or you get fired, that God's joy, whether it's overflowing or whether it's simply His joy, would be enough for you and I. And then we stepped into week three, going, all right, God, you're in my corner. That feels good. You're like Mickey in the corner. I'm Rocky. We got this together. And God, you're going to encourage me and you're going to fill me up with joy. Cool. Bring it on. What's next? And God goes, actually, I got a really neat plan. See, your life, even though you feel like it's been tattered and bruised, I got something amazing. I'm going I'm to make it beautiful. And well, I'm going to open up your life and show other people the beauty that I have. And my biggest plan is I'm going to use you to, to care for and teach people about my love. And we go, huh? That makes no sense, God. My life's messed up. I'm a wreck. I just, I can barely make it to work on time. I never make it to church on time. Hint, hint. And all of this stuff that goes on. And God, there's no way that people would know your love because of me. And God goes, the perfect, most, my plan above all else is God loves others through you, is what we landed on in week three. And we go, huh? He goes, because of my love, people will see, yeah, I'm for you, and yeah, I bring you joy. But when they see and you open up your life to others, they're going to see a posture and a beauty and a love unlike any other. And they'll realize that's not from you. That's from me. And they'll go, wow, what is that? And you'll go, yeah, I don't know. Look at this. This should not come out of my life. And this, I look at that, should not come out of my life either. But God's doing this great work. And they'll go, I want to know more about that God and that Jesus that you follow. And it puts us in a position for week four. And well, um, I'm going to warn you that week four could derail weeks one through three. That you can believe that God is for you. That you and I could believe that God is the one that is our joy. And we could go, you know what, God? I believe that you are the one that shines light, which sounds crazy, but God goes, I'm going to use you and people are going to know my son Jesus because of your life, which is a huge weight, but God goes, I'm going to be with you and they're going to see it's me. That you and I could walk through all three of those and this week's precept could derail you. And I would actually contend that it's the precept, it is the movement in people's lives that undoes all of the foundational things because they fall to this lie. And before we get into that, I'd love it if you guys would pray with me so we could spend the next 20 minutes, 20 short minutes. So if you're already done with me, you only have 20 more to go that maybe we could be teachable enough that God could teach us something that we haven't figured out yet. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for today. I thank you for your son, Jesus. And as we gather together here this morning at our 10 a.m. service, I just ask that you will do what only you can do, which is the miraculous in our lives, that you will make us receptive and teachable to what you're bringing to us that these are things that maybe just maybe that we're not there yet. And there might be some of us this morning that go, you know what, my life needs to be revolutionized and changed. God, what does that mean? And my prayer is that for, for some of you guys that are here this morning or watching online, that you would have the opportunity to go, you know what, I want, I want to get baptized and we're going to get the awesome chance to watch that at the end of service. But maybe for some of us, we've been at this a while 
and we think we know it already, God, will you break our hearts and let us know that none of us have arrived. Whether we're in the nursery or whether we're sitting in here this morning, that we all have a next step to take. It's through Jesus we pray all these things. Amen. Now, here's what I know about life. You're going to encounter pain. I don't wish that upon you. Like somebody had mentioned in one of the previous services online, I had preached about finding joy in God alone and not in things, and then they drove home and their van broke down. And the comments were, Jason, why'd you preach on that? It was not my fault. And we get into today, and I'm not wishing pain upon anybody in this room, but here's what I do know. You're going to experience pain. You're like, wow, I'm really glad I woke up and came to service today. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> Thanks. I needed some encouragement. Well, we're going to get to that. But the way that we get encouraged is to note the reality. And the reality is, is that we're going to come across moments where we have difficulty. And we can trust that God is for us and that God is our joy and that God is going to shine light through our lives. But then I get these emails, phone calls, counseling moments, Facebook messages, and text messages like this one. We're on the brink of divorce and I'm terrified of what's next. I don't know what to do. Another uh, parent said, my child is on a downward spiral and I don't know what to do next. I'm absolutely dumbfounded that God would allow this. What do we do? Some of those were in the last few months, but this one this past week is someone sent to me, I'm so depressed and I don't know what it means to be better or whole or if I'll even be able to embrace it once I see it in front of me. Now, all of these things, and the, the list could go on. There's a litany of ways that we get contacted as pastoral staff and leaders about the things that are happening in your lives. And what happens time and time again is people are reaching out, usually at the end of or close to the end of their rope. Now, these are people that would say, I do believe in those precepts. God is for me. God is the one that sustains me and, and you know, moves in my joy. And, and I believe that God's going to try to use my life, whatever semblance of it that is, that God's going to try to figure that out. But then we get to this place where we encounter these things. And, and I would say every single one of you guys got this on your way in. You got a compass. If you'll take that out, I want you to hold it for the rest of service. You can take it out. Some of you will just spend the rest of service trying to figure out where north is. But a compass is used to guide you. A compass is used. Now, this is before your Android or iOS device was in your pocket, and you could just whip that sucker out, and it would get to the direction. Before then, you would use these things called paper maps and a compass to get around. Now, for some of you, you're pumped that you have one. You're ready to go out into the woods with a dull knife and conquer all things. Slow your roll there, Paul Bunyan. See, a compass is able to guide us and direct us to where we need to be going. Now, you could misread a compass. You could say, I think I need to go X direction. And even though it points in the proper way, you could think, I think I know better. And when we encounter these moments of pain, of hurt, it's very easy for us to get blindsided so much by the place that we're at that we forget the direction in which we're headed. And many of the people that contact us, whether, you know, by whatever means, would say, I think I'm starting to believe some of these things, but this moment has derailed me. This moment has set me off course, and I'm not quite sure what to do with that from here. And I believe, as I, as I was taking notes and starting walking through this, I believe this precept to be true. That the outcome into the unknown, we have our bubble, whether it's on the brink of divorce, a child running rampant, uh, depression, anxiety, whatever that thing is, fill in the blank, that fill in the blank moment, the outcome into the unknown, if that were to pop and burst, petrifies us, often terrifies us more than the war in the moment. That the thing that you and I are battling, the thing that we're facing in that moment, we believe all those same truths. God is for me. God is, sustains my joy. God will shine a light. But uh-oh, the bottom drops out. Things hit the fan. And what we say is, God, I'm not quite sure you're delivering on the promises that you said. I think that I know a better way. You've given me direction, but. And it cripples us. 
it leads us to a place where we're not quite sure where to go next. And this is why people who are new to faith or people that, like I joke around and say, like you've been going to church since you were a fetus. Your mom and dad were walking into church with you. You've been in all the time. There is nobody that is not susceptible to this precept. And it's why it undoes everything else. Because you can go, yeah, God's for me, but. Yeah, I, th- I know that God's my joy, but. And while God can shine a light on me, look at what's happening. He set me off course. And I would contend that it's not God that set you off course. You either put down the compass or you're reading it wrong. Or you've picked up something that you think gives you better direction. Whether it be that you follow your astrological sign, which is ridiculous, by the way. (laughs) Can we just put that to rest? I'm a Pisces and I'm whatever. Stop. That's dumb. It's super dumb. All right? Because I looked at, no. God's the one who put those stars there. Chill out. God knows your steps. God knows what's going on. Then we go, oh no, and we pick up these things. Oh, well, somebody said the world's going to end and blah, blah. No, it's not. God already talked about it. God, no, man doesn't know the hour of the day. Anybody, the world's going to end. No, you're dumb. Sorry. Hey, I don't know these things. You're, and then we go, we sit around the water cooler and we talk, we put down the compass and we ask our friends. We sit around and we'll get in a group chat with our girlfriends or our guy friends. We go, hey, what do you think about this? And they'll give you all kinds of advice. That's usually bad. Because what they do, most of the time, our friends will want to make us not joyful, but what? Happy. And so they give us direction that has nothing to do with God. That's why we always say, find somebody who loves God and loves you, but loves God more than you, so they can say things that you really need. And you go, I don't really like that. And you go, well, God told me that too, because it's right here. I'm not going to base it on feeling or yours or mine. I'm going to base it on what God directs us. And it changes everything. But what we do, we get derailed because often in the moment we don't know and there's just that overwhelming. I don't know what's going to happen on the other side. That's why people stay in awful relationships. But I'd rather be together than be unhappy in the unknown. I'm like, you're unhappy right now. Oh, my kid's off the rails, but I don't want to like, I don't want to push them to things that, that would hurt them or like put them in where they need to be or put them in a school that would be a little heavier or do this or do that or reprimand them because I want them to be happy. I was like, how's that working out for you right now? Oh, well, I don't want to do X, Y, or Z because it's because you're looking at the wrong direction. Love it if you turn over. We're going to look at this story in 1 Samuel chapter 14. It's in the Old Testament of the Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we give them away for free at the Get Connected table in the lobby. Stop by there, pick up your brand new Bible. It's yours to keep. There's no catch. Fill it out. You can highlight in it, write in it, take notes in it. No, you won't get struck by lightning. We know because we put Bible pages from wall to wall and no one's died yet. You can also download a Bible app. You can go to our digital Get Connected table. Everything that's out there online, ForefrontChurch.info. Click your Your New Bible tab. We have a brand new digital Bible waiting for you there. And our personal favorite, because we're biased, is the Forefront Church app. It has a Bible. It has a notes section every week. There's notes there that you can take about what's happening here. And you can have a leg up because where we're going to go in the message is already right there. So you can be like, I know more than the other people around me. So you can use that as well. All the tools are free. Because we know that if you connect with God more than just this hour together, that God will do something beautiful in your life and he'll begin to change your life. You might go, I don't need changing. I go, okay, try it. And God will begin to change you and you'll see a difference in your life as you engage the Bible and engage praying and all these things. And so we're going to be over in this passage in 1 Samuel chapter 14. We're going to be starting in verse 6 in a moment, but I want to give you some background. Many of you, even if you remotely have been around church or you've just watched pop culture, it's very hard to not hear references or see references to the story of David and Goliath. You've probably heard it referenced in maybe your favorite TV show, maybe it's used a lot in music, that this thing, we're actually going to talk about the moments that happened just months before with who this guy that would be his best friend down the road, this guy named Jonathan. Now, see, many people know the story, even if they're not familiar with God and faith about David and Goliath, but they go, Jonathan, is that like the footnote sidekick character in all of this? I would contend that in this battle for what could derail you from the first three weeks here in week four, that it's the example of Jonathan that you and I can follow if we so choose, because it's your choice. You can come here every week and listen to all the things and nod your head and your life never change. Because you have to 
with your cognitive brain there, decide to make a change. And so my hope is that you would be teachable enough to say maybe a change can be made in my life. And it starts with Jonathan over in 1 Samuel chapter 14. Now they are in battle before we get to verse 6. There has been a war going on. We understand war. If we're you know, over the age of 20, we've watched that take place in our world. It continues to happen. It's one of the things that I absolutely loathe and hate that that continues to go on, but it's a reality. It happens. And at this time, there's this war that will eventually get mulled up and really kind of explode with David and Goliath. But there's some pre-things happening, the story behind the story, that begins to lead up to this. And we meet up with Jonathan in verse 6 of that passage, in first, or excuse me, in 1 Samuel chapter 14, starting in verse 6. If you don't have a Bible and haven't gotten one yet, it'll be here on the screen. We're going to read this first verse and pause, and it'll set the stage for nine verses. And so if you've never read or engaged the Bible for ten whole verses, I promise you won't die today, okay? Verse 6, Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, come, let us go over to the outpost of the uncircumcised men. Let's pause right there. Things are getting weird. All right. If you're a Christian and you talk to your unchurched friends, and I love that we have people that are brand new. This is the first time you've been engaged with God to people that, again, have been in church a long time. If you are a church person and you talk to your unchurched friends and you guys do such a beautiful job, that's why the church continues to move and grow. And they say the Bible's weird. Don't go, no, nah, really. No, the Bible's weird, all right? There's stuff like this. And don't leave like, well, the Bible's really not. No, that's, this is weird, okay? But I want to explain culturally why he would say this. He's talking to his armor bearer, this guy that would help him into battle, whatever. He says, hey, basically this would be culturally, they think they are better and more godly, God-following because they've been circumcised. This is a cultural thing, and they're kind of using this as a, this is like a, a ancient yo mama joke. All right, like here, this is what they're saying here. Like we're a little bit better. Let's, we're kind of dissing them in conversation. Let's go over to those uncircumcised men. And these, the Philistines, they're huge guys, large army. There's dozens upon dozens of people over there. And he's explaining this, but don't lose this next part of the verse. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. I want to pause there. This is the crux. This one word is the crux that changes by one decision, by one thought that sends you and I off course from where God has us. We can believe God is for me. God is my joy. God is living light, you know, shining a light through me. This one moment, and it can happen to anybody. Everyone is susceptible to this. Don't, and if you sit there, oh, I'm not susceptible, watch out. This one word is ridiculous to me and I don't know why anyone would follow Jonathan after this. We're going to follow this. Perhaps the Lord. He's trying to convince this guy to go into battle with him. And the best he can do in this moment is perhaps the Lord. If you ask me today after service, hey, Jason, I have a proposal for you. I'd love to go skydiving. Perhaps your chute will open. <laughs> I have a thing that I would think, perhaps I'm going to stay on the ground. Because if God wanted me to fly, he would have given me wings. I'm not getting out of a plane. And when I do get in a plane, I'm going to stay in it till it lands. Because jumping out of a plane seems dumb to me. You tell me perhaps, Jonathan's in this moment. He says, perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. That's not a sales pitch that is going to work more often than not. But here we go in this moment, and I love this, because Jonathan believes that God can do something that only God can do, whether, because he gets this point, that God is our joy, dear armor bearer, whether God is abounding or whether it's just his joy, we're going to follow this and we're going to trust him. And look at the response of said young armor bearer who's given the worst proposal on mankind's face of the earth. Verse 7, do all that you have in mind, his armor bearer said. Now it sounds like he's just going to be like, do all you have in mind. But no. Go ahead and I am with you, heart and what? Soul. Hey, Jonathan, you gave an awful proposal. And because, and this is, don't miss this. 
Because God is the one that sustains you. It's clear in your life. He's the one that is behind you. It's clear that you are not about happiness. You are about God's joy. And it shines out of your life that you've given one of the worst sales pitches ever and I'm on board because I trust you because you trust God. That even if your, let's modern day context, even if your marriage soars or it fails, you're following God. Even if your kids spiral off into a deep abyss of hurt and pain or they soar and they become the next president, You're trusting God. If you get that next promotion or you lose your job, you're trusting God. He continues on. And this is where it gets super weird. It says, come on then, we'll cross over toward them and we'll let them see us. This is is the dumbest logic I've ever found in the Bible thus far in verses 9 and 10. Let's Let's read this together. If they say to us, wait here until we come to you, we will stay where we are and not go up to them. But... If they say, come up to us, we will climb up because it will be our sign God has given them into our hands. What he's saying, if I'm his armor bearer, let's think this out logically. What he's just told his armor bearer is these big guys that could kill us, we're only two guys and there's dozens upon dozens of them. If they tell us what to do, we're just going to listen and maybe die because perhaps God will be with us. And the armor bearer is like, all right, let's go. This is still not a great sales pitch by Jonathan, but all of this is in light of God is for me. God is my joy. God is my light. I am trusting him. Whether it soars or whether it fails, I will be faithful. And I want to encourage you with this. God does not call you to success. If you, if you have success in life, it's success in faith, that's awesome. God calls you and I to faithfulness. To stay the course. And it continues on in verse 11. So both of the men show themselves at the Philistine outpost. Look, said the Philistines. The Hebrews are crawling out. They're referencing them like they're animals. The Hebrews are crawling out of the holes they were in. The men of the outpost shouted to Jonathan, his armor bearer, Hey, come on up. We'll teach you a lesson. And I don't think they were talking about their ABCs, friends. Come on up. We'll teach you a lesson. So... Jonathan said to his armor bearer, climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. The armor bearer's like, derp, derp, derp. okay, let's go after this. I'm still, if I'm thinking logically, yeah, Jonathan, I see your life, but I'm a little petrified. Why? Because when marriages start to rattle, when kids start to go off the rails, when friendships, when work, when all that stuff shakes, what do I do? I get petrified about the unknown and I'm scared to death about the future. And so it locks me in in the moment instead of trusting and staying the course. And don't this verse that we're about to read could be the change that you and I need in our lives. And it may sound totally dumb when we first read this next verse, but I promise you, it's something that has changed my life. Here's what it's shared in verse 13. Jonathan climbed up using his hands and his feet with his armor bearer right behind him. And the Philistines fell for Jonathan's armor bearer and they killed behind him. Now you may think, okay, cool, they overcome. I don't want you to miss the first part of this because I read it and I go, why? Or that. I go, don't be, do not be afraid. For God is with us. Um, That's my daughter's memory verse from last month. She shouted it at me the other day. I'm like, hey, what do you want to eat? Do not be afraid. I'm like, what do you want to eat? Do not be afraid. I'm like, you better be afraid. For God is with you. And so it's ingrained in me now. Jonathan climbed up using his hands and his feet. Why in the world? Don't miss this. Why in the world did God note how he climbed up? For most of us in this moment, as we read this, we go, that is a duh kind of thing to say, God. What did he do? Use his teeth climb up and and grab it with his mouth? No! He used his hands and feet. So why would God put something in that makes total sense to any of us? Don't miss this. He has told his armor bearer, perhaps God will work in our favor. We're going to trust God. Look at my life. And then he trusts God that God is going to provide. 
And if you're climbing up a ladder with your hands and your feet, how much can you defend yourself? Zero. In a moment of war, in a moment of battle, he gives 100% trust to God when he could have gone off course and trusted the water cooler conversation, the text message string, the stars. He trusts God. You and I want to know the moments that we go off the rails. It's the very moments that we go, I know better than God's direction. Yeah, God, you're for me. Yeah, God, you're my joy. Yeah, God, you're my light. But I know better because this situation that I am going through, this hurtful, just a hard time, I know because it's mine. God's going, I know how to get you out of it. I pray that you stay the course. Jonathan climbed up using his hands and his feet. His armor bearer right behind him. The Philistines fell before Jonathan's armor bearer, followed by they killed all of them. In the first attack, Jonathan's armor bearer killed some 20 men in that area, about a half acre. They are going buck wild. I mean, they are full tilt. They go, God's delivered them. We are going to conquer this. And for many of us, the reason that we hold back in these moments of hurt and pain is because we think we know better and I would just ask you a simple question. Are you ready for a change in direction? Are you and I ready for a change that could drastically maneuver us into not only the will, but beauty of God? Because he is the one that is behind us. He is our source of joy. He is the one that's going to use a light to shine out of your life and mine. And we let one moment, think about it. The one moment, the one decision, the one thing that happens to us that maybe we caused or an external force is caused and we let it completely derail us from the path God designed. And what does it do? It undoes that God is for me. We shake our fist at God because we're off the rails and we go, God, why did you do this? It derails our joy because we say, God, why don't you figure out a way to stop this because I just want to be happy. God, there's no way you could shine a light through me because my life is too messed up. Look. And what I want you to know is that God leverages your difficult times. If you don't get anything else, I hope you get this. That God leverages your difficult times to grow your trust and faith. And for some of us, we go, I'm tired of growing. And what we're really saying in that is we don't like the route and we don't like the guide. God, I don't really know that you know better I know you're for me, but what we're doing is we're unraveling that in that one moment. God, I know you're about my joy, but God, I know you can shine a light, but we're unraveling everything in this one moment. And I want to encourage you with this, that God isn't trying to make your life or my life easier. He wants to make it more meaningful. No one grows through happy-go-lucky times. And you may say, Jason, I just want a moment of it. I just want a breath of it. Every time, I love the opportunity and I love my, watching my wife as she has done a phenomenal job as she works out and moves through this journey. But every time that she works out, what does she do? She tears the muscles. Why? Because that's what workouts do and they have to be torn, they have to hurt before they can get back to the place that they need to be. You want to grow? Embrace the fact that God is for you, that God is your joy, that God shines light through you, and he's leveraging that moment to make you the best version of you possible. God, take this away. You'll never grow if he takes it away. So the question to ask yourself is, what is God trying to teach me now? See, because God leverages your difficult times to grow your trust and your faith. My hope and prayer is that you won't put that compass in your pocket and you won't deviate to someone else's direction. You go, all right, God, you're for me. Teach me your ways. God, you're my joy. Teach me the direction. God, you want to shine a light through my life? You have a path for me to interact with people, men, women, children, neighbors, friends, family members. God, I will stay the course. And you'll grow because of it. But again, I can't make you do anything. You have to choose that. 
My prayer is that you'll choose wisely. Would you pray with me? Thanks for tuning in to the Forefront Church video podcast. Our hope and prayer is that this has left you encouraged and challenged you in your faith. And you might have some questions and some ways that you want to figure this out. And we want to help with that. Head over to ForefrontChurch.info. And there's a couple different ways that you can connect. Click the connect tab and let us know how we can be praying for you or a staff member can be contacting you this week. Maybe you have just been encouraged by this and want to support the ministry here at Forefront Church. You can click the giving tab as well as other tabs that are in there to help you along in your journey with God. And so we're thankful for you. Thanks for tuning in. And we cannot wait to see you again here online on the video podcast. We love you and we'll see you then.